Chapter 6 of The Way of Peace. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Recording by Sunny Abdullah. Chapter 6 Saints, Sages, and Saviors. The Law of Service. The spirit of love, which is manifested as a perfect and rounded life, is the crown of being and the supreme end of knowledge upon this earth. The measure of a man's truth is the measure of his love, and truth is far removed from him whose life is not governed by love. The intolerant and condemnatory, even though they profess the highest religion, have the smallest measure of truth, while those who exercise patience and who listen calmly and dispassionately to all sides, and both arrive themselves at, and incline others to, thoughtful and unbiased conclusions upon all problems and issues, have truth in fullest measure. The final test of wisdom is this. How does a man live? What spirit does he manifest? How does he act under trial and temptation? Many men boast of being in possession of truth who are continually swayed by grief, disappointment, and passion, and who sink under the first little trial that comes along. Truth is nothing if not unchangeable, and in so far as a man takes his stand upon truth, does he become steadfast in virtue, does he rise superior to his passions and emotions and changeable personality. Men formulate perishable dogmas and call them truth. Truth cannot be formulated, it is ineffable, and ever beyond the reach of intellect. It can only be experienced by practice it can only be manifested as a stainless heart and a perfect life. Who, then, in the midst of the ceaseless pandemonium of schools and creeds and parties, has the truth? He who lives it. He who practices it. He who, having risen above that pandemonium by overcoming himself, no longer engages in it, but sits apart, quiet, subdued, calm, and self-possessed, freed from all strife, all bias, all condemnation, and bestows upon all the glad and unselfish love of the divinity within him. He who is patient, calm, gentle, and forgiving under all circumstances, manifests the truth. Truth will never be proved by wordy arguments and learned treaties. For if men do not perceive the truth in infinite patience, undying forgiveness, and all-embracing compassion, no words can ever prove it to them. It is an easy matter for the passionate to be calm and patient when they are alone, or are in the midst of calmness. It is equally easy for the uncharitable to be gentle and kind when they are dealt kindly with. But he who retains his patience and calmness under all trial who remains sublimely meek and gentle under the most trying circumstances. He, and he alone, is possessed of the spotless truth. And this is so because such lofty virtues belong to the divine, and can only be manifested by one who has attained to the highest wisdom, who has relinquished his passionate and self-seeking nature, who has realized the supreme and unchangeable law and has brought himself into harmony with it. Let men, therefore, cease from vain and passionate arguments about truth, and let them think and say and do those things which make for harmony, peace, love, and good will. Let them practice heart virtue, and search humbly and diligently for the truth, which frees the soul from all error and sin from all that plights the human heart, and that darkens, as with unending night, the pathway of the wandering souls of earth. There is one great, all-embracing law, which is the foundation and cause of the universe, the law of love. It has been called by many names in various countries and at various times, but behind all its names the same unalterable law may be discovered by the eye of truth. Names, religions, 
personalities pass away, but the law of love remains. To become possessed of a knowledge of this law, to enter into conscious harmony with it, is to become immortal, invincible, indestructible. It is because of the effort of the soul to realize this law that men come again and again to live, to suffer, and to die, and when realized, suffering ceases, personality is dispersed, and the fleshy life and death are destroyed, for consciousness becomes one with the eternal. The law is absolutely impersonal, and its highest manifested expression is that of service. When the purified heart has realized truth, it is then called upon to make the last, the greatest, and holiest sacrifice, the sacrifice of the well-earned enjoyment of truth. It is by virtue of this sacrifice that the divinely emancipated soul comes to dwell among men, clothed with a body of flesh, content to dwell among the lowest and the least, and to be esteemed the servant of all mankind. That sublime humility, which is manifested by the world's saviors, is the seal of Godhead, and he who has annihilated the personality, and has become a living, visible manifestation of the impersonal, eternal, boundless spirit of love, is alone singled out as worthy to receive the unstinted worship of posterity. He only who succeeds in humbling himself with that divine humility, which is not only the extinction of self, but is also the pouring out upon all the spirit of unselfish love, is exalted above measure, and given spiritual dominion in the hearts of mankind. All the great spiritual teachers have denied themselves personal luxuries, comforts, and rewards, have abjured temporal power, and have lived and taught the limitless and impersonal truth. Compare their lives and teachings, and you will find the same simplicity, the same self-sacrifice, the same humility, love, and peace, both lived and preached by them. They taught the same eternal principles, the realization of which destroys all evil. Those who have been held and worshipped as saviors of mankind are manifestations of the great impersonal law, and being such, were free from passion and prejudice, and having no opinions and no special letter of doctrine to preach and defend, they never sought to convert and proselytize. Living in the highest goodness, the supreme perfection, their sole object was to uplift mankind by manifesting that goodness in thought, word, and deed. They stand between man, the personal, and God, the impersonal, and serve as exemplary types for the salvation of self-enslaved mankind. Men who are immersed in self, and who cannot comprehend the goodness that is absolutely impersonal, deny divinity to all saviours except their own, and thus introduce personal hatred and doctrinal controversy. And, while defending their own particular views with passion, look upon each other as being heathens or infidels, and so render null and void, as far as their lives are concerned, the unselfish beauty and holy grandeur of the lives and teachings of their own masters. Truth cannot be limited. It can never be the special prerogative of any man, school, or nation. And when personality steps in, truth is lost. The glory alike of the saint, the sage, and the saviour is this, that he has realised the most profound lowliness the most sublime unselfishness, and having given up all, even his own personality, all his works are holy and enduring, for they are freed from every taint of self. He gives, yet never thinks of receiving. He works without regretting the past or anticipating the future, and never looks for reward. When the farmer has tilled and dressed his land, and put in the seed, 
he knows that he has done all that he can possibly do, and that now he must trust to the elements, and wait patiently for the course of time to bring about the harvest, and no amount of expectancy on his part will affect the result. Even so, he who has realized truth goes forth as a sower of the seeds of goodness, purity, love, and peace, without expectancy and never looking for results, knowing that there is the great overruling law which brings about its own harvest in due time, and which is alike the source of preservation and destruction. Men, not understanding the divine simplicity of a profoundly unselfish heart, look upon their particular saviour as the manifestation of a special miracle, as being something entirely apart and distinct from the nature of things, as a being, in his ethical excellence, eternally unapproachable by the whole of mankind. This attitude of unbelief, for such it is, in the divine perfectibility of man, paralyzes effort, and binds the souls of men as with strong ropes to sin and suffering. Jesus grew in wisdom and was perfected by suffering. What Jesus was, he became such. What Buddha was, he became such. And every holy man became such by unremitting perseverance in self-sacrifice. Once recognized this, once realized that by watchful effort and hopeful perseverance, you can rise above your lower nature, and great and glorious will be the vistas of attainment that will open up before you. Buddha vowed that he would not relax his efforts until he arrived at the state of perfection, and he accomplished his purpose. What the saints, sages, and saviors have accomplished, you likewise may accomplish, if you will only tread the way which they trod and pointed out, the way of self-sacrifice, of self-denying service. Truth is very simple. It says, Give up self, come unto me, away from all that defiles, and I will give you rest. All the mountains of commentary that have been piled upon it cannot hide it from the heart that is earnestly seeking for righteousness. It does not require learning. It can be known in spite of learning. Disguised under many forms by erring, self-seeking man, the beautiful simplicity and clear transparency of truth remains unaltered and undimmed, and the unselfish heart enters into and partakes of its shining radiance. Not by weaving complex theories, not by building up speculative philosophies, is truth realized, but by weaving the web of inward purity, by building up the temple of a stainless life, is truth realized. He who enters upon his holy way begins by restraining his passions. This is virtue, and is the beginning of saintship, and saintship is the beginning of holiness. The entirely worldly man gratifies all his desires and practices no more restraint than the law of the land in which he lives demands. The virtuous man restrains his passions. The saint attacks the enemy of truth in its stronghold within his own heart and restrains all selfish and impure thoughts. While the holy man is he who is free from passion and all impure thought, and to whom goodness and purity have become as natural as scent and colour are to the flower. The holy man is divinely wise. He alone knows truth in its fullness, and has entered into abiding rest and peace. For him, evil has ceased. It has disappeared in the universal light of the all good. Holiness is the badge of wisdom, said Krishna to Prince Arjuna. Humbleness, truthfulness, and harmlessness, patience and honor, reverence for the wise, purity, 
constancy, control of self, contempt of sense delights, self-sacrifice, perception of the certitude of ill in birth, death, age, disease, suffering and sin, an ever-tranquil heart in fortune's good and fortune's evil, endeavours resolute to reach perception of the utmost soul, and grace to understand what gain it were so to attain. This is true wisdom, Prince, and what is otherwise is ignorance. Whoever fights ceaselessly against his own selfishness and strives to supplant it with all-embracing love is a saint. Whether he live in a cottage or in the midst of riches and influence, or whether he preaches or remains obscure. To the worldling, who is beginning to aspire toward higher things, the saint, such as a sweet Saint Francis of Assisi, or a conquering Saint Anthony, is a glorious and inspiring spectacle. To the saint, an equally enrapturing sight is that of a sage, sitting serene and holy, the conqueror of sin and sorrow, no more tormented by regret and remorse, and whom even temptation can never reach. And yet even the sage is drawn on by a still more glorious vision, that of the Saviour, actively manifesting his knowledge in selfless works, and rendering his divinity more potent for good by sinking himself into the throbbing, sorrowing, aspiring heart of mankind. And this only is true service, to forget oneself in love towards all, to lose oneself in working for the whole. O thou vain and foolish man, who thinkest that thy many works can save thee, who, chained to all error, talkest loudly of thyself, thy work, and thy many sacrifices, and magnifest thine own importance? Know this, that though thy fame fill the whole earth, all thy work shall come to dust, and thou thyself be reckoned lower than the least in the kingdom of truth. Only the work that is impersonal can live. The works of self are both powerless and perishable, where duties, however so humble, are done without self-interest and with joyful sacrifice there is true service and enduring work. Where deeds, however brilliant and apparently successful, are done from love of self, there is ignorance of the law of service, and the work perishes. It is given to the world to learn one great and divine lesson, the lesson of absolute unselfishness. The saints, sages, and saviours of all time, are they who have submitted themselves to this task, and have learnt and lived it. All the scriptures of the world are framed to teach this one lesson, or the great teachers reiterated. It is too simple for the world which, scorning it, stumbles along in the complex ways of selfishness. A pure heart is the end of all religion and the beginning of divinity. To search for this righteousness is to walk the way of truth and peace, and he who enters this way will soon perceive that immortality which is independent of birth and death, and will realize that in the divine economy of the universe the humblest effort is not lost. The divinity of a Krishna a Gatalma, or a Jesus, is the crowning glory of self-abnegation, the end of the soul's pilgrimage in matter and mortality, and the world will not have finished its long journey until every soul has become as these, and has entered into the blissful realization of its own divinity. Great glory crowns the heights of hope by arduous struggle won, Bright honour rounds the hoary head of that mighty works hath done. Fair riches come to him 
who strives in ways of golden gain. And fame enshrines his name, who works with genius glowing brain. But greater glory waits for him who, in the bloodless strife, against self and wrong, adopts, in love, the sacrificial life. And brighter honour rounds the brow of him who, mid the scorns of blind idolaters of self, accepts the crown of thorns. And fairer, purer riches come to him who greatly strives to walk in ways of love and truth to sweeten human lives. And he who serveth well mankind exchanges fleeting fame for light eternal, joy and peace, and robes of heavenly flame. End of chapter 6 Recording by Sunny Abdullah